have you been able to make internships more accessible for both interns and companies? I think the real secret is Ed Hollyrow Pierce, co-founder of Virtual Internships and CRCC Asia, providing free remote internships for students with companies throughout the world. So what's the catch? Is this free? Yeah, but there really isn't a catch. It's about, do you have things that could be usefully done? Would they be a learning experience? And if so, are you willing to just put in that little bit of time and effort? How much have you actually raised and how do you do it? Just over 14 million US dollars, which was very exciting. I understand the landscape is great and understand your business model, but what should ventures be communicating when they're speaking with investors? Well, that is quite literally a million dollar question there, Dan. You mentioned earlier about personal development, which is a really great point. It's something that we're all grappling with what else could we be doing big big question there i think quickly before the episode starts we've noticed that 83 percent of you are not yet subscribed if you find this podcast interesting and would like to support us please subscribe and we'll make sure to deliver the best guests and best content possible thank you very much enjoy the episode ed how have you been able to make internships more accessible for both interns and companies i think the real secret is recognizing the different end users and the different beneficiaries you know an internship is of course there to benefit the participant the intern but you've also got to take into account the company and probably the university or an institution as well so look at the pain points for each of those people and make it easier whether that's geographic boundaries whether that's making sure the learning outcomes are there giving some structure uh in some cases that's actually working out how we can do this for free for post companies that would otherwise simply not take an intern. You know, we've got this huge demand and we know that companies are willing to take an intern, but often they won't have the budget or they won't be able to justify a big salary. So for some of our best programs, we've actually been able to find stipend funding from either governments or from universities. And that's been super exciting. Happy to talk more in due course. So what's the catch? Is this free? Yeah. So for a host company that wants to host interns through the virtual internship or Instagram, in fact, uh, it's free for the host company. They do need to have project outlined in advance. We need to check that the student or the intern is going to be doing something valuable, valuable for both sides, you know, not just, let's say, cold calling or the online equivalent of photocopying or picking up coffees. Uh, so making sure the project makes sense for both sides is, is I suppose, the, the most important thing. But there really isn't a catch. It's about saying, do you have things that could be usefully done? Would they be a learning experience? And if so, are you willing to just put in that little bit of time and effort into onboarding the intern and making sure that you give them some good feedback as the program commences? So Ed, you and I have a bit of a backstory, right? So we met 10 years ago. I was actually a participant, I was an intern on one of your programs in Shenzhen. And I remember you sat it up in front of the, this big cohort of of interns and um, it was quite inspiring at the time, I remember. And it, it laid the foundation for me actually to go on and create businesses here in China. And you've been able to pivot to another company, which is virtual internships. So you had CRCC Asia, which you still have, and virtual internships. So how have you been able to transition between the two? Yeah, absolutely, Daniel. Well, I mean, first of all, thanks for having me on the podcast. And it is really great to have stayed in touch with you after all these years. Um, as you say, cool backstory. Um, what really uh, happened in the beginning is myself and my co-founder, Dan, you know, we had a China studies background. We knew that there were loads of opportunities in China for young people. And really, all the only the, the only options there were at that time were go backpacking or teach English. <clears throat> so we thought, let's find another way. And uh, we were talking to a, a couple of universities, and we started our first program. We saw how amazingly transformative an international internship could be for you know young people such as yourself. And I mean, you're you are a, a real case study, a role model right there. You've embraced China now. Um, and I suppose what we what we found was huge levels of transformation, great outcomes, but honestly, masses of barriers. You know, whether that is the cost of service departments for two months in Shanghai, or whether that's the problems of getting the right internship visas, or, you know, uh, some people's parents not wanting them to go, 
or those families or indeed their universities not necessarily being able to afford the cost of that program. Um, so those were some of the barriers that got us thinking, how could we do this better and reduce or remove some of those barriers? So uh, we actually started talking about virtual internships around about 2015. So CRCC had been going for maybe eight, nine years at the time. And uh, we thought, you know, we've got to just give it a go. Uh, Dan and, <clears throat> and myself sat down one kind of around New Year time um, and said, look, one of us should just like go for it at least while we, you know, we should get the ball rolling. And we did. And in 2018, we registered virtual internships as a, as a British company. And very soon after that, you know, took on angel investors, started moving forward, got some early, uh, <clears throat> early adopters from our university pool. And, uh, I mean, really the rest is history. We've, we've had some, some good luck along the way, being at the, in the right place at the right time. And obviously, uh, the, the pandemic was a catalyst. It was an eye opener for some different industries and for some different university partners to work out like, oh, this is a solution for quite, uh, uh for a wider audience for different industries, different skill sets etc and i suppose the additional pieces to mention are we were very 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 lucky that at just the time when virtual internships needed a big increase in capacity and team numbers we had that team ready to go you know we had people who had been delivering great internship programs in china japan korea vietnam in person and they were pretty glad that they weren't about to lose their job when no travel was able to take place. So we had the team in place. We also had the communications with many universities, you know, so some who had been sending five, 10, 20 students to China or Japan or Korea were able to say, oh, you know what? This is a solution. Virtual internships is doing it. And it's, I'm speaking to some of the same people. So Definitely a, a good pinch of luck, um, but that's essentially how we how we made that particular pivot. You mentioned your co-founder, who sounds absolutely fantastic, but how have you been able to build that relationship with him and what advice would you give to someone that is going into business with a co-founder? Yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean, I hope one day you get Dan Niven on your podcast. Um, he's just been uh, an incredible co-founder and colleague to work with uh we actually did a uh, a master's together 2005 to 6 in um international management at uh, soas school of oriental african studies in london so we knew each other from you know studying together which was great and then we also you know got to know each other really well during that early startup stage and I do think that that was incredibly valuable, you know, actually sitting opposite each other at a kitchen table, sharing some of those early pains and plans and, you know, seeing, getting to know how we each worked, I think was, was really valuable. You know, we used to literally do one month in my house, one month in Dan's place so that, you know, there was a, a an equal burden on the electricity bills, you know, the heating and stuff. It was like, really early stage we weren't paying ourselves and uh you know it was a good chance to to get to know each other i think also you know you obviously need huge levels of trust in a co-founder so just knowing that we're both seeing the emails that come into the shared inboxes we're both looking at the program evaluations we're both noticing whether there's you know a team member that needs a bit of extra attention or an area of the business that might benefit from a bit you know some extra eyeballs um being able to get in tune with a co-founder i think is really important and so i guess anyone who's early on their journey don't don't regret spending extra time extra communication with that co-founder because i think it will really strengthen you as a team um ultimately i'm sure you're going to ask in in due course about our trajectory and investments and so on but i think part of what our investors saw was that we'd We'd been around the block once or twice as a as a team, you know, and we we knew each other. We could communicate, and I think that's quite important. 
So uh, when when you're when you're building a, a team and when you're selecting co-founders, being able to sit in a meeting, do a presentation, share the burdens without it being a major stress, I think is quite important. If there's loads of internal friction, then the external stuff will will suffer and will get lost a bit. How did you deal with those internal conflicts? Because I'm sure they do arise from time to time. So I think um, good communication is something that Dan and myself have, I think. Uh, you know, so being able to, to clearly say, and, you know, if something hasn't, uh, you know, hasn't gone right, being willing to work out why that was and do better next time. So I think high levels of self-awareness is quite important, certainly for me. Um, you know, I suppose you could refer to it as like picking your battles. You know, it doesn't, we definitely, we, we, we definitely went through the early processes of spending days thinking about our first business cards and whether we wanted, you know, red or blue or, you know, <laughs> whose name should be on top, all of those kind of things. But being able to do that in an early stage where there wasn't too much at stake is really useful to to kind of find your place and um <clears throat> yeah so i think you know good communication good self-awareness uh and and being willing to uh, do a bit of an analysis of what hasn't gone if something hasn't gone well how could you do it better um and then you know next thing i would say is great team like early members of the team some of whom stayed stayed with us you know four or five years some even longer been really essential and, and really great for the the business progression so going back to the point on investment and trajectory how much have you actually raised and how do you do it yeah sure so um i guess first of all the backstory you know we did see rcc asia pretty much organically you know we took on a tiny bit of angel money to get things going but essentially that was kind of a 10 plus years labor of love grew it inch by inch step by step and we knew with virtual internships we were a bit more sophisticated we had things in place and we could do things a bit faster but what we did need to do is go out and raise some money <clears throat> so first of all again um uh using whatever was around us and making sure that we took advantage of any resources we had uh we raised an angel round from existing uh, contacts. A few uh, came from my MBA that I was studying at the time and um, a couple of other people that we knew. So we got an angel round together, took advantage of the um, UK SEIS, you know, entrepreneurship investors scheme, which was good. And then we were, you know, having this kind of fast growth during COVID, I guess, um, and did a pre-seed very quickly followed by a seed round and then a Series A round. Um, so the Series A was uh, just over 14 million US dollars, um, which was very exciting. Uh, I mean, once again, you know, a huge shout out to Dan Niven, who really did did do, uh, you know, the vast majority of the work on that. But we, I think we came across as people who who knew what we wanted to do. We had a vision, we had a mission, and we had a good knowledge of the landscape and the pain point that we were solving for so like that that bit of it is history and uh we've still got a long way to go let's not underestimate you know what there is to do in the future I understand the landscape is great and understand your business model but what should ventures be communicating when they're speaking with investors well that is quite literally a million dollar question there dan um uh i think the um the landscape is always changing. So first piece of advice would be to really understand you know, who you're pitching to and the the lay of the land. So, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, growth of revenues was probably given a bit more, more weighting in that decision process. And I would say now it is very much uh, more weighting on pathway to profitability. When are you going to get into the black? Um, you know, it's not going to be quite so focused on just, you know, spending plans, but more focused on when, uh, you know, when you'll actually turn a profit. But I'd say, you know, really important to uh, analyze and research who you're meeting with. Always be ready with a great deck. 
and have practiced it a lot. Um, recognize, you know, your competitors and, you know, what's going on in the industry. You've got to be as, as ready as possible. Uh, and, you know, don't be afraid of talking to a lot of people. Um, you know, don't, don't, um, don't talk to your best leads immediately. Talk to some of the, the slightly less important ones. If you can get a bit of traction early on, that's great. You know, it's no one really wants to be the first mover. So to go in and say, actually, we've got a couple of people willing to put some money in already, or we wanted to go with these guys, but actually they're not quite right for one reason. You know, you you, you want to be, be able to have as many options as possible, I'd say. You touched on the MBA earlier, which is an interesting one, because I hear a lot of people that do MBAs, they learn great skills and knowledge, but it's really that network that they build. So for people considering doing an MBA, such as myself, I've always considered it. Should we do an MBA? Yes or no? Personally, I would say yes. Um, pretty much every time. Obviously, it'll depend on that individual, you know, and, and the cost of the MBA, not just financially, but also in terms of opportunity cost. Are there other things that they need or want to spend their time on? But for me, I'm really passionate about self improvement, self awareness, personal development, and professional development. And for me, uh, MBA came at a really good time where I had a good amount of real practical work experience. I'd learned a lot, but perhaps I wasn't quite so aware of the some of the terminology and the existence of some some kind of proven frameworks, I guess. You know, whether they were simple things like Porter's Five Forces or, uh, you know, some of those other quite well-known, you know, people who, who've gone into big consultancies probably know these things already. But if you've done <clears throat> a bit of maybe entry-level work experience or you've worked on your own business for a couple of years, MBA is hugely, hugely valuable. And I think it was the knowledge and content, but it was also very much about the, the cohort themselves. So on the off chance, any of them is watching this podcast, huge shout out to you guys as well. Um, it it was really great to be able to have that experience with a cohort and everybody came out. It was an executive MBA, so everybody had some work experience. It was also very international. And being able to share, you know, my own experience with other people at the same time as them sharing their experience and then us kind of mapping it across to some of this academic or pre-existing content was was super fun. Um and yeah, as as I said, like um, I actually did my kind of MBA thesis uh, on converting CRCC to virtual internships and did a kind of write-up of that and felt in a good position to present it and also um, was able to bring in a couple of my MBA cohort as angel investors. So that was, you know, just really nice that, that that was able to happen yeah it's exactly what i thought i thought that that network is really really key because it seems to be a very conversible network uh trusted you've all studied together so it seems to be one of the main advantages of doing an mba yeah 100 percent. and the the other bit that i'll just add briefly is don't forget to look at you know, scholarships or bursaries or any kind of financial assistance. You know, I was lucky enough to get quite a, a, a chunk off my fees at, uh, you know, my MBA provider, which was um, Bay Business School. And there's more than people think. You know, I think uh, the, the the top line cost of an MBA can seem quite high. You've got to make it work. You've got to think about how you can achieve that. I would not say go... Go in, don't go into it blindly. Don't take out loads and loads of debt. Try and work out how you could do this, maybe part-time alongside working, which is what I did. Maybe you can find some scholarships. Obviously, you might take a loan, but don't do anything super crazy and expect it to pay for itself in six months after finishing because I don't want anyone to, to end up in that kind of pain. <laughs> yeah, there'll be people watching this podcast say, yeah, that it. He told me to do an MBA and now I've got no money. You mentioned earlier about personal development, which is a really great point. It's something that we're all grappling with. What else could we be doing if someone's got a nine to five job or a business? 
what is that something extra that they can be doing as a side hustle or as a, another business? Yeah, big, big question there, Daniel. Um, I think I love a framework. So um, for our, our programs, our internship programs, and even for myself, uh, I really love things like the NACE um, career competencies. There are eight skills. And it basically gives you something to kind of hang your stories off. Let's say communication skills. Once you start to think about it, you can then become more self-aware and then you get some better better stories, better anecdotes, and you are better able to articulate those skills. So I guess number one is, you know, find a good framework. It doesn't have to be the NACE framework. And AC could be, I think there's one called Skills Builder here in the UK. Um, there are a couple of others worldwide. And it's just, you know, if you picture that nightmare question in an, in an interview where somebody says, what are your best three skills? You don't need to be fishing around out of a pool of 100 skills. You've got ready-made eight skills that you know most employers are really looking at and valuing. And then you can kind of pick your three. And because you've got a limited number on a framework, you've got some good stories and some good anecdotes and you kind of know what you're going to say. So I would say number one is a framework. And number two is make time for it. Okay. Um, whatever works for you, whether it's a kind of Sunday night activity with a glass of wine that you just think about, you jot down some notes or whether that's a five minutes every day as it goes, or, you know, I know some people prefer to do a big chunk, uh, you know, less frequently, but still try and make it regular. So once a month, are you committed to going and doing that professional development? Obviously, every situation is different and there are more and more uh, tech solutions. You know, I'm a huge fan of LinkedIn. Uh, if anyone wants to find me, LinkedIn is probably the best place. Uh, some people will get a faster response on LinkedIn than they might do from email. But uh, there are different platforms and there are lots of other, you know, bite-sized courses and le learning and development options. And same point as the MBA, really. Uh, don't get don't get fooled into just spending loads of money and thinking that's a fix. Um, it's got to come with a bit of a bit of dedicated time and a bit of structure that invariably it's up to you as an individual or one as an individual to to implement yeah those extra courses and extracurricular activities are really key and I, I always think what else could i be doing more what else can people be doing more could they be going out to more events could they be speaking at events could they be organizing events could they be doing social media doing videos or podcasts how can you grow yourself as a person as a knock-on effect also help support your network and the people around you 100 percent echo that i i mean again for the benefit of your listeners i think the availability of different kind of events um networking opportunities is something that it can be a bit easy to overlook or it just comes at the wrong time and you deprioritize it <clears throat> personally i i love meeting new people and i love finding out about different industries, talking through different, you know, business cases or, or problems, et cetera. And uh, for most people, I think if they think hard and work at it, they can find a positive benefit to getting out there and, and networking and talking to more people. Obviously, there'll be some uh, different different networking scenarios or different events that work for different people. Uh, but I, I would strongly encourage it, as you, as, as you said, to sort of put yourself out there. Ed, we're seeing the job market changing rapidly with AI coming in. What do you see as the future of work? I think we are in a period of, of huge and very fast change. Um, and I would encourage people to think what must have happened when we got electricity for the first time. Right? This is an analogy I've gone into a, a bit previously, but you kind of want to find a balance. Somebody turned up with electricity in your workplace or in your industry. You want to try and be able to, first of all, just enjoy it. You know, switching on an electric light is incredibly empowering for you as an individual. You can choose to stay up a bit later reading. You could choose to do a bit of extra exercise. You could choose to lift your family better, do some cooking in the not in a candle light. 
So that's kind of AI right now. You know, ChatGPT is making some people's lives easier, some editing software, et cetera. These meeting software, I think, is is quite amazing, actually, at the moment. Um, but I'd encourage anyone in that particular industry to really try and push themselves to think what the future might look like with something like that. <clears throat> Don't leave it to someone else. You know, obviously... The, the, the great folks at OpenAI have created ChatGPT and there are lots of, you know, clever people around the place that are actually, you know, doing some of the underlying coding. But if you think of it a bit like electricity, you know, how could you use it to make that machine faster or better? Or how could you use it to make whatever, whatever you need or whatever's in your industry? And I think that's kind of going to be what, some of the future of work looks like and then from there you need to extrapolate backwards and say well what are the key skills or what are the key attributes that essentially are going to leave you on top or near top of the pile or in a comfortable position and i think it's going to be those core transferable skills you know leadership good communication good teamwork and collaboration really good resilience you know i think you need to be adaptable and resilient because stuff is coming at a faster pace. You need to be able to upskill. You need to be, be able to take on board new technology. I always say to people when they're sort of crafting their CV or when they're going into some details about some technology that they, that they believe they can do really well, it's actually more important to show how fast they've been able to learn it and how fast they've been able to onboard themselves or upskill themselves rather than actually say, I've achieved this level, right? I don't need to know that you are a Salesforce power user. What I need to know is that what got you to becoming a Salesforce power user is your own adaptability, your fast learning, your inquisitive mindset, curiosity, and your willingness to go out there and sort of improve yourself. Because then if I'm not using Salesforce, I still know you're going to be great at, at my CRM or my systems. Yeah, so I think that's just going to be extrapolated in the in the sort of uh, you know situation that we're finding ourselves in. To be honest, hey, can you dig a little bit more into that? Are we going to be the leader of robots? What should people be looking at specifically when it comes to AI? So I think um, staying really up to date with is possible in technology and what people are building for. You know, if there are people right now who are spending every hour of their waking day learning some coding languages, I feel like that's a mistake because there's already news out there, even for someone relatively non-tech like myself, that says, you know, coding, most coding can be done by AI. You know, it's the case of being able to describe the website that you want and the API connectivity that you want and describe that well to uh you know an ai platform and the coding can be built so don't don't learn to code learn how to, to communicate really clearly with ai <clears throat> so that's just an example where i actually think staying on top of you know the news and what is possible what it's possible to do and even trying to just look a couple of steps ahead what are people building what are they solving for would put you in a better position. If you are a student deciding whether to learn language for the next 12 weeks or next 12 months, or whether you're thinking, actually, I could do a, a course on how to program and communicate AI better, probably the latter makes more sense, right? Because that feels like something that's already, already happening, already being built. So... Long story short, do do follow your passions, do follow whatever you're interested in, but try and stay a bit ahead of the game and just think, you know, you can, you can also prepare yourself for sort of some what if scenarios, right? So how are you using AI to benefit and automate your business processes? So, I mean, a, sh a shout out to our COO, Jason Can, who is just like honestly amazing at this kind of process, basically understanding what people do on a daily basis, what they spend their time doing, and then, you know, researching, I think Jason would say information diet is very important. 
you know, basically working out what is being done, what what is available and accessible for AI. So, I mean, we, uh, quite honestly, we'd love to automate even more. We are on a pathway towards more automation. We still are having to communicate uh, directly with businesses to talk to them about taking on an intern. Like we haven't been able to completely automate it. But we're using AI in some pretty smart ways to look at student profiles, to improve the way they present themselves. Uh, students all record a video to introduce themselves to a company and show their enthusiasm, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and there's loads of great AI out there that's solving you know, glitchy videos or um, let's say less professional personal presentation and delivery. So <clears throat> we're trying to embed some of that, which is quite exciting. Uh, obviously, lots of efficiencies to be made around meeting software, summaries, action points, that kind of thing. We're all, you know, adopting those as fast as possible. Uh, and I think it's quite empowering, really, because it's actually shifting the balance of where people are, where, where people can add value. You know, so being able to look at your business and also your employees and work out where which areas they find challenging, either because of extra time spent or perhaps because they're not quite at a level they want to be at. You know, it could be could be English language level, right? In a marketing scenario, they'd love to create better posts. Well, there is definitely AI out there that's helping with that. So you no longer have to be the junior, junior marketing assistant because your English isn't quite polished enough. You can actually fix that. But I think it's important to still make sure you're learning from AI as well. You know, obviously AI is learning from us with every single task we give it. It gets better and better. We mustn't let that get ahead of ahead of the curve. We need to still work out how can I better utilize AI? How can I use it to become better at what I need to be better at in, in two or three years time? Amazing. Thank you so much. Ed, where can people get in touch with you? LinkedIn is probably the best. Um, Ed Holroyd Pierce, luckily not too many people with that name. Um, and I'd yeah, be delighted to connect with people, uh, both on the, on the virtual internship side, but also, you know, I'm passionate about, um, so UK China relations and would love to do a bit more in that area. So if you've got some interesting projects going on that tie those things together, please do get in touch. And um, hopefully I can give my Chinese a workout as well. <laughs> now your Chinese is really good, Ed. It's, it's inspirational. And I want to thank you personally because you really laid the foundation for me to grow my career and business here in China with CRCC Asia and that original internship that I did 10 years ago. Oh, Daniel, thank you very much for having me again. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, yeah, very best of luck with everything. Thank you so much, Ed. Really appreciate it. And I hope all of you out there really enjoyed this one. Drop a comment, like, subscribe, and see you next time.